Sporting compliments of the season. I'm Mickey Campbell and welcome to a new series of The Big Questions. Now, in this last year, Britain has been shocked to the core by some truly appalling cases of child abuse. Baby P, Shannon Matthews, and uh, the, the man who fathered nine children by his own daughters. Is it now time to think the unthinkable? Should unfit parents be stopped from having more babies? Well, that is our first big question. And later, uh, we'll be asking, is Britain still a Christian country? Are Christian values still the dominant moral force in our society? And also, after spending Christmas with your friends, relatives, your offspring, their offspring, some of you might be wondering about our last big question. Are manners overrated? We're in Croydon today at uh, Whitgift School with a local audience and lounging in the comfy seats. We have Hackney Vicar, the Reverend Rose Hudson Wilkin, Steve Chalk, the founder of the Christian charity Oasis Trust, Kelvin McKenzie, former editor of The Sun, and the evolutionary biologist and campaigning atheist professor Richard Dawkins. <laughs> What a great lineup. Now, we've all been horrified by the story of Baby P, who endured appalling cruelty at the hands of his mother, her boyfriend, and their lodger. Uh, he lived only 18 months, but Baby P's mother became pregnant again after he had been placed on the at risk register. Now, would it have been better if Baby P's mother had been stopped from adding to her family of four, uh, given her um, record? The Dutch Parliament is being asked to consider such an idea. It's being proposed by uh, Mario van Dijk Dugan. Uh, I'll, I'll get it right in a minute, don't worry. A, a Labour MP in the Netherlands. So first things first, how do I pronounce your surname? Van Dijk. Well, compliments of the season. It's great that you've come over to talk about this. How would you like to see it working? I would like to see that parents who have proved that they are not able to give a safe environment and safe family to their children, and they have proved it because the magistrate has taken one of the children out of the family, that they should be stopped for a period of two years to give birth to a new child and use that time to make the situation at home so to that their 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 existing yeah. child yeah. can come back. And if the situation isn't like that, if it's not safe for their existing child to come back, it isn't safe for a new baby as well. So, uh, Mario, contraception would be administered, yes? yes? Okay. Temporarily. And reviewed after two years, how's the situation now? And, if necessary, put on another two years. Mm. By a judge. Mm -hmm. There has to be a third party considering the whole situation and what's going on here. But we are now are... I've got examples of families with eight children. Yes. One after another. He Damaged he children. Hero heroin addict mothers and alcoholic parents. Alcohol, yeah. heroin, yeah. Uh, mentally totally confused. Uh, uh, unfit parents, would you use unfit that? Unfit parents. Not good enough. Mm, not good enough. The standard is not perfect. Calvin McKenzie. The standard is good enough parenthood. And I'm not seeking for a, a measurement to punish parents. I'm just looking for a way to, uh, help, to, children. to help children. To help children. To prevent do, do we need something like this here? Yeah, it'd be a stunning idea. Great idea. There are, I think, something like a million alcoholics in this country. There are 300,000 drug addicts. All these people are simply spawning children for two reasons. One, because they possibly have nothing else to do in their lives. But secondly, these have turned into baby farms. This is a way of not having to go to work normally. They can carry on having the children. They get fantastic state benefits. And, and, and the issue is this. How many more baby peas does this audience want? do we all want to happen? There will always be terrible examples, I agree with that. What seems to be happening right now is we blame the social workers. I'm not entirely sure that's fair, especially when the parents seem so vile. But we never seem to be able to stop these issues happening. And my bet is we have simply got to say enough is enough. We must stop certain kinds of mothers, certain kinds of fathers. We don't allow people who've had a car crash where, they've, where it's been their fault, we don't allow them to carry on driving. We don't allow people who carry on beat to beat their dogs. We don't allow them so to, to carry on, on having animals. You're rather engaging well, Steve here. Well, yeah, I, I, I actually think it's an awful idea, an absolutely awful idea. I think the idea of state intervention... 
in this way is absolutely extraordinary, if, forgive me for saying that. I also, I also think that who's going to make the laws? Who's going to decide? Who sets themselves up as judge? And in our well, we culture, have, we, have we have so many. No, no, we, we have, have so judges. many dysfunctional people who emerge at the top of society, as well as the bottom of society. But the, but the more important thing, the, the charity that I'm responsible for, we we're, we're involved in lots of very A poor communities. A million children that are abused every year and, in this country. And Oasis is working. The charity that I launched is working in many communities, poor communities around the country. What we've got to deal with is the deep underlying issues and invest in the lives but of people. But by the time you've dealt with the deep underlying issues, is it not very often too late? And I also, think we it, make these... Short-termism, that's what this is about. No, I would say it's the contrary. And I hope you excuse me, English is my first language, so if I'm hesitating. <laughs> but no, I want to use the time, the time out just to improve the family situation. It has nothing to do with wealth or poverty. Oh. It has to do, I also knew, well-educated parents who are really not capable we, of giving a safe environment for them. If we really them. cared, we'd invest resources into communities that have suffered long whilst the rich have got richer and the poor have been left. You're quite right. Yeah. Okay. Can't you? Can't you do it? Can't you do it? Let me bring Peter in as well. Peter Saunders from the National Association for People Abused in Childhood. childhood. Mm. Now, there's a lot of people uncomfortable with an idea like this because it conjures up all sorts of Me thoughts too. of eugenics and people, oh, yes. people mm. being you know, prevented from having children. Mm. Isn't it a human right to have a child? I think it probably is a, a right to have a human child, but I think it's good that we're having the debate. And um, as extreme as it may sound, I think some things are worth examining. Um, not that I'm necessarily agreeing with the proposal on the face of it that, that Mario is making, but our, our charity, NAPAC, hears mm. from thousands of abuse survivors every month. Thousands. And I think anything that can contribute to preventing future child abuse has got to be worth considering. Having said that, and I think it's a point that's, that Steve Chalk made, and I think it's about changing our the culture the way we treat children generally. Mm -hmm. um, we hear from people, yes, we hear from people that have been brutalised by their parents, um, people who perhaps, had they been a baby pee and survived, um, and thank God most children do survive childhood, um, would be getting in touch with us now about the terrible treatment that they had at the hands of their parents. But we also hear from people who are at the top of the social tree, who were perhaps put into care by their very well-off parents when they were very young um, into things we call boarding schools, as an example. And I'm not knocking all boarding schools. Well, there's a big spectrum, we, isn't there? I it, mean, let's, exactly. Let's, I don't, so I, I think mm. it, it's, it's sometimes unhelpful to just um, concentrate on one small aspect when I think that the fact Would, that we're yes. having the debate is most important. Would that be the danger? That's an interesting point, uh, Rose. It would be concentrated on those at the bottom of the socio-economic tree just because that is the way that prejudices in society tend to go? It probably would, but my concern with this proposal is that it is missing the mark. We should be addressing this whole issue right from the start in terms of families. What has happened in our society today is that we've made it so normal and so acceptable for, for youngsters, for, for anyone to just get pregnant. But hang on, can I just put something to you? People mm. have to go through hoops to adopt a child or to to foster a child and we apply all these stringent rules to them I mean that's the point isn't it I see you nodded yeah. so in your what is in fact wonderful English there, there, take up the point there are no rights without limitation mm. parental rights as the question was asked to my neighbor mm. yes everybody has a right to bring up or to, or to, to get pregnant or get children it's a right, but it has its limitations. It has a duty as well. Rose. If you're choosing for a child, and nowadays we can. Yes, but what I'm it saying wasn't possible is we're, for 50 we're dealing years. with it far too late. We need to be addressing this issue long before the first uh, pregnancy. Uh, uh, the first pregnancy. Yeah. And what I'm saying is we need as a society to stop making it so acceptable for anyone to get pregnant. Mm -hmm. We need to be having conversations within families, with our children. We need to stop just giving young kids uh, accommodation and, and smiling at them as if it's all right. It is not all right. <laughs> and we've made it all right. And that's the problem. But that's the long haul. 
That's the long haul. Christina Blackloss, you are a, ch a ch children's rights lawyer. Yes. What right does a heroin addled mother have to bring a heroin? Have you, have you heard the screams of a, of a baby addicted to heroin? Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, what, what 20 right? years' experience, I've okay. represented hundreds and hundreds exactly. of children in exactly. child protection proceedings. Uh, so, and you've seen some, I would imagine, horrific things. So what right yes. does that heroin-addled, addicted mother or drink-addled woman who just cannot stop drinking throughout her pregnancy, what right does she have to have a child? When okay. there are people who, who would yearn to be blessed with a child. And I have every sympathy with those people. But really, the question must be, what right does the state have to stop people from having children? Should the state... Do we want to live in, in a society which allows the state to say who and who should not have but children? But it's about child protection. Absolutely. Children have a right to be protected, but children also have the right to, if at all possible, be brought up by their parents. That All the research shows that that's actually in children's best interests, and we need to protect that right as well. Calvin McKenzie. Uh, well, my main point about this is that I actually don't want to be sent the bill, because in the end it's going to be my taxpayer dollars which is going to fund some of these appalling people having children who all their life... Will, the bill will be sent back to me and people like me. Why are I these just people don't appalling, want though? Why are they, as you put it? Well, are they, they're, they're appalling in the sense that they, are, they, they need help. They are alcoholics, they're drug addicts, they're mentally confused. We, I want to give them help. What I don't want to do is then allow them to have children so that even more help has to be given to those children. Let's stop it and stop it now. Richard Dawkins. I think this is an obviously very sensible proposal. We already really? accept the principle. We already accept the principle that unfit parents are unfit when we take their children away from them. Mm. Social workers take children away. If you accept that, then you have sold the past. You have already accepted the principle that there is such a thing as an unfit child. Society already takes that responsibility on its shoulders. To if you, once you accept that, then you have no choice but to say that you also have the, have the right to deprive a parent of the right to have a child in the first place and stop the misery. Now, of course, we can all raise pie-in-the-sky proposals. We must get to the root cause. We must abolish poverty and things. Mm. Of course, we must do that. Meanwhile, however, we have a here society... And now, yes, yes. Here and now, we have a society in which we, everybody accepts that abused children are taken away from their parents. The what is wrong the with stopping yeah, them the having their children in the, the first problem, place? Well, let me come back over here. because it's a mean, huge that, problem allow because Steve, this is allow me, Steve, this guy. allow me, Steve, to come back over yeah. because the, the Bishop of Croydon is here wants to come in, and I think you want to come back on that uh, point. Just absolutely. to remind people, should unfit parents be stopped from having more children? That is what we are discussing. Audience, in just a second, if you want to make your point, please do put up your hand, but come back, first of all, Christine, on that. I have had time and time the experience of the unfit parent becoming fit. Well, hang on, you say within... unfit, unfit parent. There are unfit parents. You do acknowledge there, that. Oh, absolutely. Of right. course there are people who should not have, should not be in charge of a budgie, let alone a child. So, you know, that's, that's without doubt. But there are many people who do overcome their addiction problems, who do get help in relation to their mental health problems, and they do that within the two-year period. And when they've done it, they can have a baby, but until they do it, they can't. But that, surely that's wrong. Surely, actually, that, that if they have a baby, and I, I, don't, I can't understand the argument the that a child them. has a right not to be born. That doesn't seem to make any sense to me whatsoever. But if a, child is born, if, if, if a child is born... We're, we're, on, we're into a very interesting <laughs> philosophical area now. Uh, 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 Richard, yeah. Richard, Deere is, Richard Deere is pricked up there. Actually. You are depriving a child of the right to be born every time you refrain from sexual intercourse. Yeah. That's not the issue that we're looking at. Yes, it is. No, no you see, no, I think we've got a problem because here. Because that's a choice matter. No, Richard, you've just said, let's not be pie in the sky, and we're looking at someone here who deals with this issue, but you're rejecting what they say. That's pie in the sky. So let's have... listen to this lady. <laughs> it's academia Julia. gone mad when we need to <laughs> listen to people on the ground. Well, let's listen to somebody else on the ground or, in, or, or in, in the audience, if I can put it that way, away from the, away from the elevated position, which uh, <laughs> you four uh, learned uh, friends uh, occupy. Uh, Julia, you adopted a little girl, right? That's right, we have. Um, 
we got a little girl whose birth mum drank alcohol when she was pregnant with her, and that's why she's got brain damage, and that's why we set up the FSD Trust, the charity, to support others in the same situation, bringing up children who have been damaged by alcohol. And this is the Fetal Alcohol Disorder so, Trust. That's and right, this is, this yeah. is, there are a, a, a million, I think there are a million alcoholics, there are three million children who have alcoholic parents, that's the figure, which yeah. just just comes to me. I mean, how is she? Will she ever fully recover? Oh no, because it's permanent brain damage. The brain is damaged by exposure to the alcohol while the child is still in the womb. So they are born uh, with, well the medical term is static, it's unchanging. It doesn't improve or get any better. But she's, a, she's your darling daughter oh, yes. and she exists <laughs> oh, and she's yes. with you. And don't you thank God for the fact that she was oh, born? Oh very much so. She's very definitely a gift to us from him. But in terms of the question and debate today, I did a straw poll around our parents and carers, and we have everybody from foster carers to birth mums that mm. we support. And I thought their answer would be no, totally against it. Quite interesting, one of them, our birth mums who used to be alcoholic said she wished somebody had offered this to her. The interesting issue, though, was they all used the word offer. <laughs> it wasn't forced on them, it was offer. The other interesting point that everybody came back to us and made was it wouldn't work though over here because we haven't got the support services. Mm. As one of the things that sort of Steve was mentioning in terms of you've got to work with families and offer them mm. the help and the support so they can become a fit parent. And especially in terms of alcohol abuse, it's been the poor relation in terms of funding and but investment over here. If you're talking about support, I mean, baby P was visited countless times. 60 times, yeah. Yeah, by, by, by social workers. Views, views from the audience. Yeah. I yes, think sir. I'd like to suggest a middle way. I'm a doctor working in medical ethics. I like the idea of time out. I think we should be having this debate. But the key idea is about fully informed consent. Offer, yes. Coerce, no. Yeah. Uh, Mario, OK. <laughs> it's the, the question again, does the state have the right? The state has the obligation. According to children's rights, and England has signed that as well. The state is obliged to seek for safety for their children and to prevent harm and to give them a, a safe environment. So it's not a question. It's not a question if the state should come into the family. The state is already allowed to come into the family. That's what all these organizations are talking but about. Can you understand the, the reason for some people's distaste because of the associations with the sort of the Nazi regime and people prevent people being forcibly sterilized by but, the state? But you know, some people do believe it's on the same road this, don't they? I've heard that and I've got that uh, letters as well. But I also got a letter from a grandmother who is taking care of her two grandchildren already and who wrote to me, my daughter has 20 years to come in which she is fertile. She's pregnant again. What are you going to do about it? Give me an answer. I'm, I'm getting older as well. Mm. That I, of course, it is very sensitive. And if anybody comes up with a better idea, um, you want to hear I it? I never <laughs> present. No, I never present my bill because I hate it as well. But I don't but a, think an, we an, can. Is it a necessary evil? It is. Okay. And you have to do both things: help the families, but in the period of the time out, it doesn't help if you add a new problem to already existing. Let's problems. Have a couple of quick views from the audience, very quick, if you could. Yes, yeah. gentlemen in the uh, yellow can shirt. I, can, I, can I address what uh, Mr. McKenzie said? Uh, he alluded to the young girls having these babies for the benefits. Yeah. And I don't think uh, they do it for that reason. If you listen to these young girls, they say they want the babies, and they also want the babies to love them. Yeah. And even working people now would argue that the child benefit payments that they get are not enough well, Ka to bring up a child. Ka Karen Matthews was on nearly £300 a week from uh, all the child benefit that she had with her five children. Do you think that's a point? The yearning for love, Kelvin McKenzie? Seven I, I don't know the Karen Matthews one was an absolute disgrace. I think she had seven children from five five different fathers and uh, they lived in terrible circumstances on a quite poor estate I mean if she had had none of those children would that be an advantage my suspect my suspicion both for the children and for society the answer would be yes isn't this better for society Bishop well, of Croydon well, there's a wider issue here which is to do with um, who is I think Steve brought it up earlier who is going to say who should be allowed to have children who shouldn't and are, are, are we now going to start saying that, that, for example, bankers shouldn't be allowed to have children because the value <laughs> systems that have sustained the banking system are corrupt? 
I mean, the, uh, it's, not, it's not ridiculous. It's a this is the route you just re uh, refer to, groups and the Nazis. Yeah. My proposal isn't about groups or professions. It's always about individuals. The same and individuals... Children. Children. Children, but the individual parents. So, much, 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 say, Mark, much, much, as you, much as it might offend your uh, unimpeachable liberal principles, this idea, the very mention of it, Bishop, surely you should be taking your, spe your tinted spectacles off and wanting to protect children. So how, do you want, how do you stop children being born into these circumstances? How, how can you have tinted spectacles when you're dealing with grassroots communities every day of the year? when you're dealing with people dealing with um, terrible moral difficulties. You know, we're not dealing with categories of unfit parents. We're dealing with individuals who have their particular circumstances, their particular dilemmas. And as we heard earlier, some people cope very badly. My wife is a health visitor on a, a big London estate. She sees it. You know, she sees it every day. But you don't simply bring in laws that say, well, here's one panacea um, that will, you know, set us up for the next couple of years. Richard Dawkins? But we already do it when we take children away from their parents. No, you see that? What's the difference? There's the massive difference. There, there is a massive difference. And the problem is, Richard, we make so many mistakes at that. Yeah. The, there is no infallible well, we, way through this. Of course we you make know mistakes. That's true. <laughs> so, it's so, the same mistakes. I mean, it's the... No, we <laughs> make mistakes sometimes when taking a child away. Who decides? Who plays God in this whole thing? But I people thought that play... you didn't like people playing God. Oh, that's so silly. <laughs> People play God when they decide whether a child should be taken away from its parents. We already do it. What's the difference? You, uh, Nick, uh, Nick, Nicky Bowman, you, you grew up in very difficult circumstances, parents alcoholics, uh, but you, you fought through it, you survived, and you're here, and you've been, you know, you're five siblings, and you've been successful, so does this concern you? Yes, greatly. I, I think, first of all, I know plenty of bad parents who aren't addicted to anything. <laughs> um, <laughs> secondly, uh, I think one of the main reasons that myself and, and my siblings survived our childhoods as well as we did is that we had each other. And as the youngest of six, in fact, I would be the baby that, that wouldn't be. I'm the person that wouldn't exist in this yeah. scenario. Yeah. Um, and I think, I think fundamentally what it doesn't do is it doesn't give, surely, the mother, because this is a, a bill that's about mothers rather than parents, but a mother, any incentive? If you're a mother and you're aware that you have a problem, is this going to incline you to ask for help? Or is this going to incline you to, uh, to keep your problem hidden? And I think one of the biggest problems with alcoholism is that it tends to be very secretive and hidden, and that isolates the children and mm. makes things worse not better a hugely complex issue you've had the last word and would you actually show your appreciation for to Mario for coming over from the Netherlands and talking to us about this we appreciate it. put your hands together for us. Thank you very much. Now, if you want to have your say all you need to do is log on to bbc.co.uk forward slash the big questions follow the links to the message board and we're also asking on this morning's programme, is Britain still a Christian country? And are manners overrated? So send us your thoughts on those topics too. Well, in Britain, Christmas is undoubtedly the biggest family get-together of the year. But how many people celebrate it as a Christian festival? All that greed and consumerism may owe more to uh, mammon than God. 72% of UK citizens might, uh, might take the box for Christian on the census forms, but only a tenth of those attend church on a regular basis. So is Britain still a Christian country? Uh, Kelvin McKenzie, I wonder, do you think it is or not? I, th I think in terms of uh, going to church, churches, uh, say Church of England specifically, is clearly a dying church. Mm. And I think, if I remember the facts right, uh, I think only 5% of our nation will actually go to Church of England uh, by 2015. But the values of Christ, the Christian values If you, take, if you yeah. take the values, whether they are Christ's values or values that society embraces, which is, a, I think, the way I'd prefer to put it, I would say that most people, a majority of people, try to live by some kind of tenant. They like to be decent mm. to their neighbours. Mm. They like to raise their children correctly, strangely, despite the previous debate we've just had. <laughs> yeah. uh, and to be honest, I sometimes feel a bit difficult about all this, that I'm not, not an alcoholic or a drug addict. So I think it, I'm thinking of becoming one. It seems to be more interesting. Get better state handouts. Anyway, <laughs> um, anyway I just thought I'd say that just to get the whole well, thing the thing going. Is, I mean, can I just 
just can I can I can I come in? One, one the, the reality the reality is mm. that most of us, not just in this room, but generally, want to live our lives by certain values. But whether they are whether they whether it was Christ who adopted them or that we gave them, well, we as good the people moral gave values. them to. Okay, but let, for, for example, if it is said that the, the press is, is a mirror of society, yeah. you know, we, we read what we want to read and we buy what we want to buy because mm -hmm. of what's in the newspapers. Yeah. I've mean, just noticed that some Christian principles, always a good thing to do. Um, how would a tabloid newspaper sell which adhered to these principles, for example? Judge not lest ye be judged, love thy neighbour, and, lo and the aforementioned, uh, love those who persecute you. You wouldn't sell one copy, would you? Well, I, I tell you what, the, the, only, the only paper I know that does that, The Independent, is just about to go bust. But, um, yeah, you're right, we are very judgmental, yeah. generally, but we're very judgmental about our neighbour generally. I don't like their fence, their car, I think, I think I, I, you know, I don't like those trousers that bloke wears. We, we all have a view about something. I think that is slightly different from the well, not very society... It's, it's not. Uh, yes, I think I think you can be you can be judgmental about somebody and and at the same time be fairly. But it's the well, word Christian. Christian I'm saying, look at his trousers; they're terrible. <laughs> I mean, <do> you know? <laughs> well, I'm a bit worried about your suit. <laughs> yeah. Bishop of Croydon uh, hasn't Christianity. Um, I mean, a lot of the advances in, in, in medicine, in science, in, in, in human rights, with gay rights and women's rights, they have happened in spite of Christianity, very no, often in the face of Christianity. No, you could, you could argue that those things couldn't have happened without Christianity. And one of the interesting things, debates that I've been involved in in Europe has been the attempt to rewrite the European Constitution and to write out of it any reference to the Christian history of Europe. That's like pretending Stalin didn't exist. You know, it, I mean, it's fact that um, Europe has been shaped by Christianity and Britain in particular in different ways. Just to be pedantic, Britain isn't a country and the different parts of Britain um, have been shaped by Christianity in different ways. And to pick up on Kelvin McKenzie's point, a dying church, I mean, there are 1.7 million people who worship in an Anglican church each month. If you took the National Secular Society, they have around about 3,000 members, we'll get them all into one of our cathedrals, except the cathedrals are usually full. So how you judge whether it's dying or not is a different matter. Well, but 6.7% get... on average attend uh, any Christian church on a Sunday in this country. Yeah. It's not a lot compared to, well, things ain't what they used to be. No, but we've also got, well, no, things aren't. That's the whole point. The world keeps changing. Patterns of uh, family life that we were talking about before have changed. Sundays have changed. The way the week works has changed. But the Church of England now has over 6,000 fresh expressions of church. We don't even count them in our figures in the 1.7 million. There are things, imaginative, creative things springing up all over the so place. So in that case, not should, just in the, that case the Christian values should inform society at every level. Do they, Richard Dawkins? I think we are a Christian country, historically, and I agree with the bishop. You, you can't just wipe out history. We are a Christian country. Uh, you can't understand English history. You can't understand European history without... Christianity, literature, you can't understand English literature without understanding the religious history of our, um, of our country. But this um, is academic. Do we live on a practical daily basis by well, Christian um, principles? If, if, you, if you're asking whether, whether we live by Christian moral principles, we don't. Uh, we live by a ge general moral principles which are uh, partly informed by Christian teaching, partly informed by specifically rejection of Christian teaching. Mm. We have picked and chosen uh, we have a, a secular moral philosophy which has given us all sorts of things. We've abolished slavery, we've given emancipation to women, uh, we look after children in all sorts of ways which have, have no biblical sanction. Um, and so we, we do have a lot of moral principles that, that we all share. Christianity has contributed some of those. But I think it would be false to say that we live in a, in a Christian moral country, but I do think that we live in a country of Christian culture, and I'm on the whole in favour of that because I, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a cultural Christian, although I'm an, I'm an atheist. Mm. But you like it. <laughs> yeah. You like he, like, like, he likes a nice carol. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Rose, on the, on the estates where you operate, where you see people who are struggling to cope, do you think that expressions of Christianity or people living their lives uh, by those principles, whether it be love thy neighbour or love those who persecute you, what those marvellous things from the, from the New Testament, are people who live like that, are they shining exceptions to the rule? 
people are definitely attempting and trying to practice it. And although I'm not wearing a purple shirt, I, I also want to defend the Church of England and said it is not dying. The it Church is, of England bites it is back. very much That's alive and kicking as well. <laughs> <laughs> and certainly where I'm from, but it is very much alive. people living on a daily basis in this country read about so many dreadful yeah. things going yeah. on in the news. But I think uh, that's, that's the problem, that although Chris, Christianity is formed sort of bedrock in terms of our culture mm. and, and moral beliefs, etc., we are failing to live it. We are failing to live it. And if we could begin to practice it more, then it would make a huge difference, both in terms of how we treat our children, in terms of how we treat our neighbors, whether our neighbor looks like us or otherwise. Was there a and time the when we did pra practice it more, though? I think there was a time when we were doing it a bit better. When? That is a good question. When, <laughs> when? But no, probably I, just before this program started. No, uh, I no. Think, you know, we've I, we've I all think, started shouting at each other. Since I think then, things right? changes. Things changes as we go along. Yeah. Um, but certainly in the community where I am from, it is people from the Caribbean and Africa who are, I see, exhibiting it. In, 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 in a much more creative way. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. In a much more creative way. I mean, yeah. people think of Dickensian. England. I mean, the terrible, terrible times of, of poverty and, and abuse. And you can't say that there were, it was a sort of the golden age of Christianity, can you? Gentlemen up there, you had your hand up a minute ago. Where have you gone? Yes, sir. I think the truth is that Christians have always struggled to implement uh, the teachings of Christ. Mm. Um, Christian, Brit Britain has been a culturally and politically Christian country. I don't know how closely aligned we have been to the teachings of Christ, going back even to uh, the time of Elizabeth I, Henry VIII, and the fact that Christians were killing other Christians for different shades of beliefs. Uh, and the truth is, we are struggling today to implement the teachings of Christ. And I think... Um, it was ever thus, eh? We always have. And I think the more we struggle, and yeah. the more we're honest, and we're, the more we are open to debate and question, um, is the more we begin to move to the practical dimensions of faith, love your neighbour, consideration for the poor, um, reaching out to the other. But what is interesting is that it just takes five bishops, it's the front of the newspapers today, it's the front of the <coughs> Sunday Telegraph and other newspapers, it's bigger than news, it just takes some bishops to say something and it's in the news, isn't it? We listen, I, we, we listen to the bishops, they've said that this, this, the, the Labour government is morally bankrupt, yeah. these five bishops. <laughs> which, is, which, which may well be true, but whether a bishop says it or not, is of no consequence. But to we somebody. listen. If it's a bishop, we listen. If you said it, you know, we, no, we, no, we wouldn't no, listen actually, in the same that's way. That's not true. That's not true. If <laughs> I said it, it would have more impact than bishops. I can be honest with you. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be truthful with you that I believe that what the bishop says is of little or no consequence. It's today. on the front page, Calvin. Uh, well, it may be, this is, this is the Sunday before New Year, there's nobody in, nobody reading papers and there's nobody actually producing them, you know. <laughs> and the fact is that nothing much happens two days after Christmas, and so they just say, oh, Bishop says, in a <laughs> the But they realize that's how it works. That's how it works. <laughs> it, it, it's amazing how there's just about enough news every day to fill up a paper, you know. And so uh, the, the truth about the matter is what the Bishop says, whether it's the Bishop of Croydon or it's the Bishop of somewhere else, is of very little consequence today. It is basically hot air. Is it? Uh, yeah, would you like to come in? Whether it be yeah, on that I'd point like or... I'd like to come in because we are saying that five bishops are talking. Who is listening? Yeah. Are they listening to what they are saying? Are their recommendations being taken up? Mm. I have so they a can school, talk all they want. Yeah. I have a school for excluded children. I work with a couple of schools in Croydon. Yeah. I work with Croydon Borough to put uh, children back into school when they're, when they're excluded. The problem I have is parents coming in who have nothing, nothing yeah. that they're using to bring up their children. No moral values, nothing. Children begetting children. Children parenting children. Nothing, nothing in the way they a should Our previous go. debate. Exactly, yes. a previous debate. What mm. we are saying now is, what exactly are we using? Bishops can be talking. Who is listening to what they are saying? So if we did, if we did abide by Christian moral values more in this country, this country would be a better place. It would be a better place because children will respect people who are older than them. They will respect their teachers, they will respect their parents, they will respect the authority, and then we, we, we're going to have is a peaceful area. Is it the, it's Peter, isn't it? Is it, the it's answer, Peter. is it the answer, Peter? Well, I, the, the reason I had my hand up, Nikki, was I wanted to say that perhaps we're missing the point a little bit in defining what a Christian is. 
No, a, Chris, a Christian is somebody who has a relationship with Christ. Yes. I, I, I'm a Christian. It doesn't necessarily make me a better person. It, it makes me work a lot harder at it. Um, and the charity in APAC that I work for is not a Christian organization, but many of the people involved in it mm. are Christians, as indeed there are Muslims involved and people of other faiths. And I think it's a fallacy to believe that... that I, I've got my, I've got my facts It's a fallacy to believe that maybe <laughs> it's just Christians. It, there are some it, very exactly. good... I mean, and, for and example, we, when, giving of, the giving of alms and charity is uh, very... It's a very important thing and for And some of us, when we Jewish leave here people, today, will be going to church Muslims. afterwards, mm. Nicky. Mm. Some of us will be going straight off to church if you let us well, get away on time. This, <laughs> this, this is my form of worship. Uh, it's not Rose. just about the relationship that we think we have with God. If it's not lived out in a practical way, then forget it. And that's been okay. the problem. Okay, how would... Uh, what, Jonathan, where are you? Jonathan Cox, you do with uh, this part of the world, Croydon. Yeah. There's a lot of asylum seekers in Croydon. If... Jesus Christ was the immigration minister, what would his asylum policy be? I think it would be a, a lot different from how it is what at the moment. What would it be? Well, I mean, just Come to, in! Just Come take, in! I don't, I don't think necessarily it would be that, necessarily, but you saw in Christ and his teaching, which I think is the real criteria we should be judging here by uh, as to whether Britain is a Christian country, not by how many people are in church necessarily, but what we do, the practical outworking um, of, of what we do as a people and as a nation. Just to take one example, there are 11,000 Zimbabweans here in this country mm -hmm. today, many of whom are destitute. They are sleeping on park benches, they're in phone boxes, they are sofa surfing, um, and it's actually many churches who, who and are... And yet the government talks a very, very tough game on Zimbabwe, well, exactly. as and, they should. Well, you know. And Christ also had a lot to say about hypocrisy. Yes. And I think, you know, when, when Gordon Brown talks about Mugabe needing to go and we ramp up the rhetoric, which, which he should be doing, he should think about the Zimbabweans, many of whom have skills, could teach, uh, could work here, but prevented from working by government policy, and are rotting here. They will be going back and building the new Zimbabwe when Mugabe goes. We are not playing a part in helping them to achieve that. Mm. So I think if, if Jesus was but immigration minister... But if we were Christians, we'd be giving them uh, the spare room, wouldn't we? Are we beginning well, many Christians are, and that's, that's mm. the paradox. Mm. Where, where, our, where our country and our government is failing to provide for these people, it's actually Christians and people of other faiths, too, who are stepping into the breach and giving sacrificially of what they have. Go on, on the immigration point. Um, um, well, I, I don't I, know if you've got we, any spare we, rooms we, in your house. The, so this, uh, <laughs> this, uh, this country is a fantastic country for um, allowing immigrants and asylum seekers generally to come in. Um, I think there are 55,000 um, Afghanis in our country today. This is uh, one of them. There are, uh, you know, this is, you know, if you went to Italy, you went to Italy or Germany or places like that, they, they won't have anybody. So I'm not going to have our country criticised on the basis that we have uh, pretty much a Christian open-door policy to those people who are pursued in other parts of the world. We're a damn good country. I, I don't like that argument mm. at all. Mm. Can I come back? Um, yeah. I mean, Germany, other countries also take large numbers of people who come and seek sanctuary. Britain has a proud tradition yeah. of providing yeah. sanctuary to people fleeing persecution. Well, what, we're, what we're saying is we need to recognise that and rebuild that public support for sanctuary. And, and actually the media ha has a role to play in doing that. Uh, and we need to recognise that there are people who genuinely are fleeing from persecution. But it's still a we toxic to issue, isn't it, in the media? You said the media. It's, it gets people going, doesn't it? Because there's a, there are various perceptions about it. But you came here. You're one of those uh, Afghanis. When, when did you come? You're British now. When did you come? <coughs> yeah, I came uh, to UK in the year 2000. So mm. uh, since last year, I got the citizenship. Uh, really support this point. Uh, this point. Uh, British, Cummins, yeah. British is a very uh, hospitable, and we appreciate the reception we receive. And uh, one point I wanted to ask. I recently uh, wrote to uh, Home Office Minister Hazel Blair to raise the issue of the illegal Afghan asylum seekers who are uh, working but they are not paying tax and not helping the economy. You, you want them to work and pay tax, yeah? If they could be given a second chance of interview because the situation in Afghanistan is very bad and uh, that would be, uh, that will help. Uh, are we a Christian country? Uh, I think, uh, I believe on that point it's a so-called a Christian, to be honest, because everybody. But on other, other aspects, are we a Christian country? It, everybody is just instead of going to church, they are lining up to the pubs and clubs. That's <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's Christmas. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Andrew, isn't it? Yes. Uh, yeah. When you were a G GP, and that was for, what, 15 years, yeah. practising GP, and now, what evidence do you see of Christian behaviour? 
Well, we've just celebrated the Diamond Jubilee of Britain's National Health Service this year, which has been said to be the closest thing to a religion that Britain has got. Mm. And I think that's a good example of love your neighbour working out. It might be me one day. It's enlightened self-interest I pay taxes centrally to fund health care that's free at the point of need. Um, but you're also doing it for other people. Now, that's the good news. What's the bad news? The bad news is abortion. 200,000 a year in England and Wales, one in four pregnancies almost ending in abortion. Pressure for euthanasia, pressure for physician-assisted suicide, two million human embryos lost in uh, unnecessary research in the last 15 years. I think we want the benefits of living in a Christian country without making the commitment in a personal faith well, you, way. You've just listed a whole lot of potential future debates yeah. for us there. I mean, I'll be happy to they are, come and join you, Nicky. Yeah, you come over for those as well, <laughs> Mario. But they are, they, are, they are all of them divisive issues, but clearly you've, you've got a view. Well, they're breaking, they're breaking the commandment, you shall not kill. We've talked about uh, mm. bankers, thieving and covetousness. We've talked about uh, sexual issues uh, and the commandment about adultery. And when Jesus was asked to sum up the commands, he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. And that's the first half, roughly, of the Ten Commandments. Hence, and then you shall love your neighbour as yourself. Okay. We're into loving our neighbour because it's good for me, but it's actually about a primary relationship with God the Father through Christ the Son. Do enough people have that in this country? And if more people had it, finally, Bishop, would it be a better country? Well, of course it would be a better country. I mean, you look at the, the levels of volunteering in our local communities, grassroots stuff, <coughs> loads of them, loads of them. The statistics are really high, come from a Christian conviction. We heard earlier about the, um, apparently the secular origins of the abolition of the slave trade. I well, believe Force it was, was Force a Force Christian, like that, yeah. Who were motivated actually by believing that they were being biblical, whereas the church was saying they were being anti-biblical. Yes. It's funny how things turn out. But uh, uh, the point I'd like to Finish make on. is that I think sometimes we... Um, we get caricatured as the church for just focusing on particular moral issues like the embryology, abortion, stuff like that. Economics, the banking system, all of those things are part of it. You can't excise them from uh, Christian discipleship. And uh, we have to look at the whole thing in the round as to see whether um, Christian values are being lived out and applied or not. Thank you very much. Last word there to the Bishop of Croydon. Thank you for taking part in that debate. The, um if you agree with what's been said, you can log on to bbc.co.uk slash the big questions, put your views on our message board. You can also let us think about what you think about our last debate. Are manners overrated? And also, you can apply to be in our audience at future shows. We will be in Oxford next week, Leicester on January the 11th, and Canterbury on the 18th. Don't speak with your mouth full, elbows off the table, and a bit of a tricky one for me, this one, don't interrupt. Uh, so, um, if you're over 40, you probably had rules about what to do or what not to do etched into your, drummed into your very being by your parents, teachers, uh, or nanny maybe. Uh, not today though, are manners overrated? Jean Brokesmith, um, well known of course, Jean, former, former head of the Lucy Clayton School of Grooming. Yes. <laughs> Have we, have we lost the plot when it comes We've to manners? We've certainly lost the plot. Have you? Sorry, I've lost my voice as well as the plot. <laughs> no, we have. I mean, people have forgotten the word please. Mm -hmm. They've forgotten the word thank you. Um, I was talking on telly yesterday about the word a thank you letter as we've just had Christmas. Yes. Nobody bothers. Uh. Um, the argument that people say to me is everybody's in a hurry. <coughs> But I think they are, you know, people bump into people, they never say, oh, I'm terribly sorry, excuse me. I've spent about 40 years, sorry to say, involved in this subject, and I've seen the decline, and particularly recently, you know, so Young much. people, are they ruder than they used young to be? Young people, yeah. um, I'm not actually having a go all the time at young people, mm. because I think you can get some terribly rude older people. Mm. Um, but, uh, <laughs> yes. yeah. but I think that um, the situation is a lot of parents have not taught their children these little special words. And I mean, I know it was drummed into me when I was a child, and I'm sure a lot of people in this room would agree. Mm. And, you know, why, why forget these words? Why do people not even get up for an old lady or a pregnant lady a on a bus? Or a teacher. When a teacher comes into yep. the class. Yep. You're a teacher, aren't you? 
yes. a local school. Mm. Do, do you, when you come into the class, do, do you not expect your class to stand? No, absolutely not. No. I, I would feel very uncomfortable with that situation, Why? actually. Why? Because I feel it fosters, it fosters an us and them kind of um, environment. And, you know, I teach 16 to 18-year-olds. They're young, they're young adults. And I think if you want respect, if you want manners, then, you know, you have to earn that, as whether you're a teacher, whether you're a student. And I think respect and manners is a two-way process. Yes, I mean... <laughs> I mean, I agree, I agree totally, because I think the word manners is together with respect. But, you know, you're quite young, um, and I think <laughs> that possibly now you find that a lot of the teachers are the same age as their, their students. But I still think, I mean, when I ran Lucy Clayton's for about 30 years, you know, I was never called Jean. I was always called Mrs. Roke Smith. Mm. I mean, I think this young lady beside me who was involved in a programme which I did in the beginning, La Debt to Lady. It's Laura, yes. Yes, yes. Laura. Um, and the first one I did while I was the principal of the school for the programme, mm. you know, those girls certainly, if they didn't respect me, and if I came into a room and they, they didn't get up. up, they had to. Yeah, yeah. We've got, boy, you're at a local school here. It's a private school, this one, where we are at the yeah. moment. Would you, would you expect, would you stand up when a teacher came into the class, for example? Yeah, we would do, but it's, it's, uh, I wouldn't say it's just a matter of respect, really. I understand the two are linked, manners and respect, but more I think it's, it's sort of a matter of the students in a class acknowledging the role of a teacher as their, their kind of superior. And everyone in the class stands up as, as their kind of acknowledgement that the class runs better when everyone acknowledges the teacher is in command mm. and thus should be given a certain <laughs> Things like that are, are just em empty gestures. I think you get respect as a teacher by being good at your job. Um, you get respect that way. You get respect by respecting. You've got to earn it. I think so, as the students do. And you get respect by respecting students' individuality but as well. And things like standing up when you enter a classroom, to me, they're, they're empty gestures. Um, and it's not, that's, that's not real respect. Well, I just so would, would, would you say then that the children carry on chewing gum, doing everything? As a no, teacher, you walk in and they ignore the teacher. Mario, what, 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 what happens? Mario, what happens in, in just they just carry on rolling their joints when the teacher <laughs> comes into the classroom? <laughs> I would what? say, count, <laughs> count your blessings, we are much ruder than you are. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I can command on that. Well, but those I cycle have... lanes as well, I mean, they're very rude. Yes, though. well, the state organises the cycle lanes. So, <laughs> yeah. so but Steve Chalk, let, let, me, let me come to, to you guys now. I mean, people do, on buses, on trains, young people do not stand up for elderly people anymore. We're, it's, we're, we're going to... Don't laugh. We're going... No, I was, we're going <laughs> that's just rude. No, no, I was, I was only laughing because I was on a train recently where um, I was standing and a young person asked if they could get up to give them that me <laughs> So I, I've now it's entered the old passage. category. Yeah, no, I, I think, you know, uh, for me, this all comes back, uh, it, it, you'd expect me to say this as a Christian because I'm Christ-centred as a person. Mm -hmm. Jesus, Jesus was not someone who dressed in fine robes. He, the respect that he had came not because he held an official position, but because people respected him for who he was. I agree with that l lady over there who said... The teacher. I, yeah, the teacher. I don't expect kids to stand in the classroom. Uh, Oasis runs a whole load of secondary schools. We know that you can get people standing up in the classroom, but their attitude to the teacher when the teacher's left is not good necessarily. Then, and respect is born in the heart, isn't it? And respect comes from well, finding a person a who great, wants to be. There's a great um, quote, actually, by uh, yeah. Rose, by J.K. Galbraith, which I came across when I was a... It was an economist. I read it yesterday. I thought this is perfect for this debate. There's a tendency to confuse good manners and good tailoring with integrity and intelligence. Absolutely. It, yeah. Ain't that the truth? That is true. But I, but I also want to say that, in, in a sense, our communities have lost that because we don't practice it within the home, we don't practice it within the local community. And if we can, again, go back to the place where we begin to practice respect, you know, on our soap operas respect, on television. interesting word. Yes. When you see on our soap operas on television, you have children shouting and yelling at parents, shut up, and, and it's seen as acceptable. It is not acceptable. None of my children were ever allowed to have their voices higher than my voice. You know, mm. you know, I, I, earn, I earn the right as the parent. Peter just said, I can imagine. <laughs> no, 
No, but serious, in our schools, we've lost it in our schools, and because of that, our children are not actually getting the education that they need. There, there is no control in the class classroom because there is no manners, no respect being shown. Teachers are not being allowed to teach. I hear what the teacher is saying, but I have been into many, many schools mm -hmm. and have seen I have seen teachers walk into a class where kids are still rowdy, yeah. teachers can't mm -hmm. teach. Whereas if you're in a situation where a teacher comes in and the children know that as soon as the teacher comes in, it's time for class. So whatever you're yeah. doing, you stop. And time for some respect. Can I, well, let, let's, can I just, can, yeah. uh, could, defer could I just to the audience? One of our problems, uh, very quickly, one of our problems in our schools is that sometimes the example set on some BBC programmes by some very, very famous presenters, they, the way well, they F and line through doesn't F really help. Oh, well, a sort of late night programmes. So. Oh, on a late night programme <laughs> presenter. Yes. But it doesn't help the because Story. We're, right. we're trying to teach our yeah. kids respect when the BBC is sometimes setting a very different example. Well, they shouldn't be watching at that time of night, children. <laughs> <laughs> when we were talking about uh, good manners, when somebody offers you a seat on the train, it's not just good manners, it's compassion, it's kindness. You know, when you see somebody courtesy. who's courtesy, who's old, and you know, this leads to other good values. It's not just being, you know, well mannered on its own. There are other things. And I disagree with the lady, the teacher there. And I agree with the young man here. I have been a teacher myself. Stand up. Yes, you should. Yeah. Not just stand up, but of course, definitely, he said a very important thing. You have to show who is in charge. It's a, it's a, yeah, it's a mark. That's an of, important thing. It's a mark of respect, isn't it? It's interesting. This word respect. I mean, yeah. I mean, you guys. I mean, you've turned your lives around, yeah. haven't you? Because you used to be involved in gangs and stuff. Now you've you've found Christ, haven't you? Yeah. But you can explain. Are, are you in a similar situation? No, I've been around bad people. I'm not a bad person myself. No, but you've. <laughs> you've been, <laughs> that's it. Yeah. You and me are in the same boat. <laughs> but, but um. But explain this, because you, you said the word respect, there's three levels to this, isn't there? Because there is, there's etiquette, and then there's courtesy, and then there's this thing, respect, show me respect, disrespect me, which is very much you know, on the street. What's it mean to disrespect somebody, and why is it so bad? Me personally, disrespect is like if I walk on the street and someone else looks in my face, and then they just see that, you've got that little ugly screw, like the ugly face, like, like mm -hmm. that, the little <laughs> ugly face, and sometimes you me now, how I change my life, I walk on, I walk past them and say, well, I'm... Turn the other cheek. Mm. Yeah. What well, did you used to do? I used to do, I used to like, call people on my phone and then we used to come up and just beat them up. Not me personally, I used to be where they're watching. <laughs> 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 but, but on the street, it's like, when you've got a gang mentality, it's like, it's a different sort of respect, it's like... You gain respect by beating people up, by selling drugs, by doing things that fit you in. It's like, it leads to like peer pressure as well. But what I've realised is that when I've changed my life and separated myself from certain people, is that I don't have to have respect because of what I do. I just give respect because that's just in me. And what it about your, did you get any of your father? Was he a role model? Um, well, I wasn't really brought up with a father. Hmm. He was kind of like, used to come in like once in a while. And that was kind of like, showed me like, oh, maybe it's good to do that. And I didn't really have a sense, a good sense of respect. Yeah. So through that, I may have done certain things. But what I've learned from certain principles is that it's easy to do good things when they do things to you, but it's, it's, it's like it makes an effort when you're doing things for people that don't want to do it back to you. So that's more powerful than just doing it for anything, anyone else. Yeah, I mean, Shanice is over here. I mean, still, I mean, you've been involved on the edges of gangs as well, haven't you, and stuff? And, yeah. And all um, I think that respect that people in this audience are talking about and respect on the street are two different mm. things, but then at the same time, it joins together, if you mm. get what I mean. So, I like, yeah. respect that, that we're talking about here is, like, giving up your seat, stuff like that. But then respect on the street, it's a different kind of respect, like... If I was to look if, at you in a funny way, I would Yeah, you know. that's disrespect. But at the same time, that can contribute to you being disrespectful to just normal people. Like, because of the way you feel, you, you feel like you, have to, you deserve to have that respect. So that could, could, that could make you not want to give up your seat because it's your seat. Why are you going to give it up? Yeah. Like, 
It's all about Sex. it's all about esteem, isn't it? Self-esteem. Where does this where does this well, Kelvin? Where does this come from? All this stuff. Well, I think the respect argument actually is an excuse for violence. Frankly, it's a signal to allow uh, young people to beat the hell out of each other, and I don't really buy this at all. There's, a, there's all the world of a difference between uh, treating somebody decently, which I would expect, which, I, by the way, has nothing to do with Christianity at well, all. Well, the judge in the Reese Jones case said it was all about fear. Wasn't yes, it? And, yeah. and, and, and although I, I admire these, these gentlemen for giving it up, yeah. I hate hearing that argument that he disrespected me, therefore I was forced to knife him. You know, I mean, please, right? It must think we're all as thick as as whatever thank but, you but they need to learn they need to learn what respect is really about and stop going around going respect me yeah. you know i mean yeah, that's sure. absolute baloney well, where does that come from respect me it comes from well, the fact that they just don't respect themselves and it's low well, self-esteem isn't I, it i think there is a lot in there mm. about people not actually knowing themselves not loving themselves not caring enough about themselves and so it is sort of turned out words and it becomes uh, something that it isn't I, and there's nothing in it for them yeah, the, the, I, just, I, I disagree Absolutely with that. There are lots of people out there who probably feel they haven't achieved whatever they wanted in their life. They don't have to go around either beating people up or killing I agree. people. I agree with yeah, you, you on that. Okay. Oh, absolutely. Right. I'm not Isn't saying they all do that. Love your neighbour mm. as you love as yourself. You, love yourself. Yeah. you can only love your neighbour yeah. when you love yourself yeah. and have a correct yeah. amount of self-esteem. Yeah. Laura, you turned your, your left around in a way. I'll come to you in a second because I know you've had your hand up. So you're next on my list. Um, <laughs> Uh, you, took, you were on this programme, oh, Ladder lady. to Lady. What difference has it made to you getting a bit of uh, finesse? It was... I think it gave me a confidence because, I mean, I wasn't, like, in a gang or anything like that. I was a... Because we're all in gangs. A 20-year-old yeah. you know, going out, partying, getting mm. drunk, doing silly things, as everyone does. Um, <laughs> and it was on a, a downward spiral, I think I was. And it, it gave me, going on the show, um, it gave me a confidence to be able to put myself out there Comedy as a young lady. Present yourself. Yeah, present myself in situate, you know, in um, social circles where I'd feel lower, you know, say going around to people that earn more money than me to make myself feel quite lower. And it taught me how to go out there and say, well, actually, I am as good as you so are. So, what, what, what are you doing now? Who are you working for now? So I work for Sky Sports. So, things are taking a mm. turn for the worse. So <laughs> 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 but no, you've, 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 you've turned went your on, life around. Yeah, yeah, before I went on the show, mm. I, you know, I was stuck in a dead end well, job. That's brilliant. And it, it gave me the confidence to apply for a job that I wouldn't ever dream of and go into this interview with these high powered people and be. Hello, my name is Laura Hearson. Yeah. You know, this is me. And just as inspiring as the fact that you guys, I mean, Calvin, was, you know, he said you've, you've turned your lives around and you, you're not into that anymore because you find a new path in life. What were you wanting to say? Yeah, um, for me, respect is about value and I believe, or valuing something, and I believe everybody wants to be valued. I think young people on the streets or young people in gangs, um, they're a bit confused and they try to find value in other ways um, of intimidating other young people. Um, of trying to put fear in other people. And I've, I remember even speaking to a young person the other day and I asked them, you know, what does respect mean to you? And he said power. You know, when he's walking on the street and he's with somebody and he can maybe intimidate somebody and that person can sort of like either feel scared of them or walk on the other side of the street because, mm. you know, they're doing something he, he feels valued in that sort of way. And I think it's a It's a, wrong it's a, it's a false of, sense of value, oh, isn't yeah, it? Very much so. Yeah, quick, quick one. Yeah, yeah, and really, we were talking about bad, this bad, bad, but no one's trying to help them. And we need more like peer mental people that are the same age we, as them. Well, that's, that that's can, a great that point, and we should finish. Listen, thanks yeah. for watching. Take part in our message board. Join us next week from Oxford at 10 o'clock.